Hi everyone, and welcome to the eighth SODB vodcast. Uh, this time we're catching up with Rolla Derby in Argentina. We have a selection of guests from across the um, country, so I'll let them introduce themselves before we go on. Hi everyone, I'm Maki Antoinette, or Maki for friends. I am a head and skating head official for Sailor City Rollers in Buenos Aires, and also in my spare time, I I'm at the WFTDA, part of the certification committee, and also I am an officiating training mentor for Latin America. Hi everyone, I'm Manuela from Ushuaia Roller Derby, Piratas del Río, here in Ushuaia, Tierra de Argentina. We are the uh, organized Patagonia Rebelde here, and well, I'm here to share this with my other mates from Argentina. Karen, see you next. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Karen. Uh, my derby name is not found, and my derby number is 404. I play for Yedras Roller Derby, a team from Córdoba. And I am kind of new in this team because I'm here since December last year, but I've been in roller derby for almost five years. I am part of the training committee and I am the skater representative for Yedras uh, when it comes to WFTTA issues. And thanks for inviting us. Hi, I'm Carla, um, or my derby name is Katrina. I'm from Mortal Kojaks, Jujuy Roller Derby. I'm from the north of Argentina, I'm from Jujuy. It's good to have all of you. Um, I mean, we're representing a very wide geographical area. I don't think some of the, so much people don't recognize how big Argentina is because we have um, one of the most southerly points in the world and then up in, um, in Jujuy and north, you're actually getting quite, you're getting quite far up the, the depth of, of South America. So we have a big geographical variation. So I guess the first place roller derby, I always start with beginnings. So I guess the first place roller derby started in Argentina must have been in Buenos, Buenos Aires, right? Um, so as a seed of conversation, so we have a conversation about how Derby started in, in Argentina and how it started in your different regions. How did it spread across the country? Um, well, I think um, here it started with girls from Tucumán and they, you know, started to teaching uh, my teammates and, you know, they teach it us. Uh, we've been here like um, five years from uh, mortal collas so uh, i don't know where exactly started in, uh, for the girls in tucumán well so let's go let's go back to basics so mackie how did you you've been with sailor city for some time right so do you know how derby started in buenos aires um i I, I mean, I haven't been around since it started, started. I came around Derby around the second Violentango, which is 2013, 14, more or less. And, uh, but I mean, uh, Argentina had already uh, went to the first World Cup by that time. As far as I know the story, how it goes, it was just like uh, this group came together. It was like pretty much a website, Facebook search. And it just came together and to start training people who have backgrounds of, uh, you know, skating, artistic skating or figure skating. And they just came together and that came to be the first group or league in, in, in Buenos Aires, which then eventually mutated into what was the Four Cuatro, uh, Sayer City, um, Liga Buenos Aires, which is actually BART. Yeah. And of course, then a whole host of other Buenos Aires associated leagues sort of popped up over time. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then everything started popping up um, yeah. by cities and by regions because, I mean, Argentina is pretty big, but Buenos Aires is also really big by mm -hmm. itself. So you just end up with a bunch of, of teams and that's how it started. Like teams started to grow and you started to get like a, a team in every city-ish in what is like mm -hmm. the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires. 
people forget how big Buenos Aires is. We had this with Mexico as well. Mexico City is also huge and it can support tons of teams in the same way that Buenos Aires can because you just people in Europe don't really understand how big Buenos Aires metropolitan area is. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it gets weird because then you, you see like you, you have some teams in the US that you only have like one team per state or one team per like X amount of cities and people are actually commuting city to city to go to a team and it's so weird because then you go like there's this team in a whole state or in a whole big half of the state and here you have at least in Buenos Aires I'm talking about in Buenos Aires you have like uh, three or four teams uh, in like two cities so it's just it's it's really big people don't actually get an idea of how big it is here in Buenos Aires, at least. I can speak for the, the people in the other cities because yeah. they can do it. I think it's a bit different outside of... Outside yes. Of, yes. Yeah. Here in Córdoba, the situation is different. Now there is one active team that actively practice, you know. But sometimes there are five teams uh, that are having matches and etc. But at the moment, there is just one. And I think that this happens all across the country. Uh, sometimes you have five teams in a city, but then the next year you, you, you just have one because people take the sport as a recreational thing or, or something like that. I think that the situation could be considered totally different from Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, there's quite a bit of distance between quite a lot of the teams as well. So it's, yeah. And obviously much yes. more so for for, for example, Tierra del Fuego, where you're literally as far south as you can be, so. Yes, yes it's, difficult, it's difficult to maintain, um, you know, to maintain the team when you are um, making a really far or strong, and I don't know how to say it, but you are putting all your effort in something and then you can't play because you don't have teams on your city, you have to commute or you have to travel to another province to have a to have a match and it's kind of difficult for us for us so i have noticed because uh, i both both historically but also because i was doing research to remind myself um i think pretty much every single city in argentina has hosted some kind of tournament or small event at some point to get people to come to them um so um i think that perhaps underscores how um how important it is to provide reasons for people to come to you and how hard it is to move around. Because uh, I know uh, Cordoba had the, the Cordobazos, I think. Um, yes. And um, obviously, um, as you mentioned, um, Teo de Fuego hosts uh, the Patagonia Rebelde. Uh, I think you were onto two of them, and I think there was going to be another one this year, but it, I think we'd have hit COVID-19 before that would have happened, right? Yeah. Yes. It's it's really sad, but uh, the situation is that our venue now is a hospital. So we don't know when we are going to be able to skate again. And well, that it's the beginning of everything. We have to start skating. The state has to start working because we can't uh, do everything that needs to be done to make the tournament uh, works. And now it's every, everyone is in their houses and we can't go out and like, it's really just here because we are a thousand people here in this island, in this city, Ushuaia. Uh, we are, well, so far away and the situation make it harder if the, this, uh, I don't know, this, illness uh, well started to affect everyone so we are everything is stopped so we don't know really but we think that the tournament should have to wait a little uh, well try to first start skating and then every everything else i mean i think worldwide this has been a problem for a lot of tournaments i mean we discovered yesterday yeah. that wfd are giving up on even WFDA champs this year. There was a hope that they might have a champs, but champs is gone as well. So I think um, you are not alone, but I would really like yes. the, um, in particular, Patagonia Rebelde come back because it would be nice to see you retain the crown for most southerly World Derby tournament effortlessly because no one else has any landmass that far south. 
<laughs> yes, that's true. And we hope to have everyone here. We want to make a, a tournament that grows and that, that became bigger just to spread the sport in this, uh, in this uh, location and, and in our country, in Argentina. I think that is really important to move this and make it work because we want Derby in South America. We want Derby in Argentina and in Patagonia, in Ushuaia and this island. We, we would love to, to be a bigger tournament and have a lot of people here just, well, knowing this place, this country and our Derby that is really, I don't know, important. Well, I think so. I think last year you even managed to get some teams to travel from, from the USA to your tournament, didn't you? Yes, yes, there were a team that came here, uh, Grange City, roller derby, that they came here. We were so pleased about that, and we have, I don't know, uh, well, it was like the first uh, time we opened our tournament to other countries and trying to make it big because, well, we are, as Karen told, we are a small team here. We are the only team, feminine team. We are a league with two teams, masculine team, and well, everywhere else team, and everyone else team. So then we are a few people and trying to, well, uh, make it work. And well, I, I wanted to add that it's not about, about well, here it's about uh, the difficult, I, I know that a lot of, a lot of teams in our country uh, they had a hard time like finding places to, to skate because it, it isn't so easy to skate here. Well, in Patagonia, we have the half and half of the year is snow or on ice and wind outside. We can't skate out. And um, well, in north of this country, they, they have rain and, and I don't know, storms and they can't go out everywhere, every time on year. So, well, in the in Argentina, I think that one of the difficulties to keep going and as a team here is that we are we have a lot of trouble to find places to skate uh, for teams. No, well, what she said. So for making a... tournaments, we have you know like problems with that. No one, our skating track is not so good, and we try to you know. Um, get another better for a tournament we tried to do and it wasn't very successful. Nobody wants to, you know, rent a, a, a baseball, a basket court or, you know, it's so hard. So we desist and we didn't, we couldn't make a tournament. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think venues are a difficult thing. I know that they've been a difficult thing even in Buenos Aires. Uh, because people were astonished to discover that even Dos Pocotro, I think, most of their, a lot of their practices are outside in various not good places. And I assume the same is true for Sailor City? Yes. Um, uh, Dos Pocotro mostly trains uh, in the famous overpass, Parque Chacabuco, like the overpass. Uh, Sailor City splits their time between the overpass and a club, which is also under the overpass. <laughs> like some blocks away but the only difference is that this is like this is a football club that uses the overpass like as a ceiling so you still don't get much shelter from wind and water actually if so last last year Piratas del Asfalto which is Taylor City's tournament last game got called off because it flooded during a storm like water starts pouring from the overpass into the into the, the ground I mean the only difference that like you have bathrooms because it's a club but I mean, it's not much because when it rains, you still cannot train because water sweeps from the from the overpass into the into the the track, and it's still dangerous. Um, so yeah, I mean, getting getting venues for events are a problem everywhere in the country. But I I also think that like other cities or other provinces always have like the upper hand in this than Buenos Aires because the most wonderful venues I've been officiating have always been outside of Buenos Aires. I mean, uh, 
the venue in Ushuaia, it's incredible. It's, I think it's 100% a playoff or a European Cup worthy venue. It's an amazing, it has an amazing floor, an amazing seating, an amazing place. You go out, there's a mountain, there's a Beagle Channel. I love it. When I went to Cordoba, I went to the UTN, um, the UTN yeah. um, uh, campus, like in the outside the city. Another beautiful um, place, beautiful yes. place to skate. And and here in Buenos Aires, you don't really get those that kind of 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 places. You cannot rent them; they won't give them to you. You have like La Rural or Technopolis, but they're from like the national government, and you're never going to get them to make an event. <laughs> So I always like like I always love having the chance to to go to to officiate like in the other in other cities in Buenos Aires because they have such beautiful venues and sometimes you actually get access to them to skate and that's wonderful. Here in BA there used to be uh, Trovador and Asturiano, which were two clubs that used Sailor City on the four cuatro for events, but you cannot rent them anymore because they are way too expensive. They're like literally where nobody's able to pay them. Yeah, I think it's sort of irony because I think people kind of expect, I mean, so in other countries perhaps people expect that the, um, the capital city is going to have all the best places, but, I, but um, in, um, in Argentina perhaps it's, it's inverted. I mean, yes. how is, I think that you would totally like host a really like even like WFTDA recognized event in venues across the country that are not necessarily in in Buenos Aires, and I think that's wonderful because I think it really puts a spotlight on other leagues that could and should and can host that are not necessarily part of for Water Sailor City. On the other hand, there are an awful lot of events in Buenos Aires. Uh, so um, I guess you make do with what you have, although a lot of them seem to be outside from what I've seen from video of them. So. Yes, I mean, almost every scrimmage mixer uh, event, they're mostly-ish under the overpass or in La Medrano, which is another uh, plaza we use that we, we yes. take over at night. Like we literally drive people off the the track just so we can skate but most events are there and you have very few leagues that actually have an actual proper space with a ceiling and walls and bathrooms mm -hmm. yes i think that, yeah. that depends on, on the situation we know that we here in soya we know if we don't have a, a roof uh, we can't skate we can't uh, play this sport, practice this sport. We can't. So there are no more possibilities to us. And then I think that is like Mikey said we, uh, now that, well, here we are a few little more, less people here. So I don't know, the state uh, places that are from, this, uh, the, well, here the, our government can be shared and it's not so hard because we are so less people here that I think that resources are closer to us here in, in Ushuaia than in Buenos Aires. Uh, I think that that's, that's true and that's, uh, that makes, uh, I don't know, I love Medrano, well, no Medrano, where the uh, Patrick skates, Chacabuco Park, the little car racing that is next to the <laughs> to the yes, world where the, the, the that the everyone are playing the and I love that. Yes. <laughs> so how? Well, you know, in Buenos Aires, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who's. Uh. In Buenos Aires, you can, you know, as a player, you think, you know, you can play almost every weekend. We have to, you know like wait uh, to play like once or twice a year because oh, we have to travel or we have to, you know, play uh, with with guys. Now we have a, a, a male team, so we, we make like scrimmage, but, you know, we don't do that that often. 
we have to travel so we can play. Yes. And I guess you tried, I mean, so we've talked about you trying to host things. Didn't, um, didn't Moto Colas had, uh, have a uh, Juego Mas Pue? Was that not a thing? Or was that a... Yes, it was uh, meant to be uh, with uh, Salta and Tucumán and um, some uh, La Rioja. And it's a scrimmage, you know, it's all mixed. And, you know, uh, we try to rotate. So uh, uh, we, we agreed to do it like three times at least a year, but we couldn't. Uh, the last time we did it here, and the time before that, we did it in La Rioja, no, in Tucumán, I think. But we cu couldn't keep going. Hmm. And in um, Cordoba, um, I mean, you have the, Cordo the Cordobazos, but how are your venues and your other... Well, we have to... When we, when we held some tournaments, we rent the places, but the space where we practice is different and we have to change it recently. In 2018 and 2019, we were practicing outside in a park, but we had some insecurity problems. We were almost robbed plenty of times. So we have to change. It's a situation that happens here in Argentina a lot. We do not have security at all. And we have to found we have to find another place. We did it because we have the support of uh, from an agency of, of govern, govern, government agency, and we could sign um, with the Ministry of Education. In we are now practicing in a school, so we have bathroom. We have uh, we have everything that we that we need. But it was difficult. We have. We had two years outside, and it was really, really bad, really bad experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it can be. I mean, and again, that's not unusual. That's not unknown outside of Argentina. But I think two years is a very long time to be without a venue, you know, anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when you say about uh, government assistance, was that local government or? national government level assistance? No, local government. I don't think that this is happening all across the country. Okay. Here in Cordoba, we have an, an agency that, that support uh, extreme sports. Okay. It's, it's, the main point is to support to, I don't know, social media or to, or giving kind of money hmm. to, to different sports that are not the famous part, not soccer, not, not something like that, but skating or uh, water sport. Because my understanding is that there is no national governing body for roller derby in Argentina? No. No. Oh. Uh, is, that a, is that a thing that people have thought about? He says looking at Mackie because Mackie's going to be the kind of person who thought about it. That's <laughs> such a touchy theme. You <laughs> just, just, just finger in the rash. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very complicated issue. Okay. Having an, I mean, you have a bunch of people who are like we need an association like uh, like France like uh, like the UK like like Germany like Mexico and you have people like Mexico. Mexico and you have people I always like take the example of France because I I think France is like they have an amazing organization there with actually the government and it's kind of crazy what they do but um. I mean, there's you're, some people will go with like, let's go with the, like, fr like France, they have like the Ministry of Sports getting into it and you have like stages and all of that. And then you have people in Argentina who believe that the spirit of roller derby is um, this uh, kind of underground thing that should be carried by skaters, for skaters, with skaters, whatever. I am not in, I don't believe in that way, whatever. And, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't believe in the vice skater for the skater because we're not just skaters in the sport. It's okay, skaters, photographers, officials, public. It's not by the skaters for the skaters, but whatever. So you have this like two two points of view. Like let's make a national organization and let's just keep it like we are like taking our own decisions and not letting any body take decisions for the team. So it's like kind of a very touchy subject. Mm -hmm. I mean, I there think, have yeah. been plenty of discussions, but it always end up in, in like 
really opposite points of views that can never like get to a middle point. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of countries go through that period. I mean, I know the UK has been uh, has bounced around. The popularity of UK IDA has increased and decreased over the years. Um, because of people having different opinions about what a national governing body should be or shouldn't be. So, um, but um, yes, it, it, it's, it's quite interesting because um, I think Argentina is probably one of the oldest, longest running countries with World Derby to not have an NGB or have had an attempt at one. Uh, so um, maybe it will happen at some point. I mean, you do have WFD member teams uh, because obviously Sailor City and, um, and, Dos Pocotu, uh, and I think there are a few other teams that are also WFD. You have Bard, you have uh, Cordoba, Yedras. Uh, who else? Someone else, someone else, I think. There is definitely but at least, I mean, No, I think that's it. That's it? Just four? Yep. I mean, we will also get more. So um, I think it always takes teams a, a bit of time to join WFGDA. So, uh, I mean, Sailor City joined not long after Dos Pocotri did, I think. So No, they became apprentice. By that time, it was the apprentice program. Yes. And now the apprentice program doesn't exist any anymore. Mm. And according to what I heard yesterday in the State of the Union, they are also going to see if they're going to change, you know, like the mechanism for teams to actually join the WFTDA. Mm. So it might get, after all of this and after we are able to play sometime again, it might actually get easier for teams to join, which I am very much looking forward because the only way that we can get a, a Latin American Continental Cup and that we can get recognized tournaments and that most teams don't have to travel um, three times a year to the other side of the ocean and be neat, like chin deep in depth is making it bigger here. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And... This is a good segue because my my ironic video clip, as I've told people before this, is um, Dos Procuatro and Sailor City playing each other, not in Argentina. But before that, uh, I do want to note that uh, the terrible irony of this is that Dos Procuatro and Sailor City played each other a lot uh, because, of course, they were the two first teams in, in um, Buenos Aires. So the first thing I found on the internet uh, was this glorious thing. And it is exactly as embarrassing as every other first World of Derby thing that anyone has um, uh, in the world. Uh, this is footage from the very first World of Derby, big World of Derby tournament in Argentina. This was the Torneo of Tango. Uh, That's the, how was that program called? Jam Tracker. Yes, this is, this is really old. Uh, so yes. this, this, is, this is Sailor City. You may not recognize them in the new footage, but this is, this is what people wore um, when they played World of Derby <laughs> back in 2012. Uh, so this is, um, I believe, the very first time that um, Los Pocotro and Sailor City played each other in a tournament, uh, back in 2012, the very first Vino Tornero Vino and Tango. Um, so um, I just thought before we show the most recent time they played each other, we should have a few minutes, well, a minute or two of what Derby was like in 2012. Um, so... Um, uh, this, I think, is actually under the underpass, isn't it, Mackie? That is one of the clubs I was telling you. That, 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 yeah. that is a typical, like, that, that's not the club that Cedar City trains, but it's a club like that. It's like a club, but it's under the overpass. You use the overpass of the ceiling, and you just get, like, some walls-ish. And it's a club, and you can rent every football uh, court there is there. That's late. I think that's called El Boli, I think. Okay. So this was this was in 2012, and I think you played it to the every year since then. Um, you played to the very regularly, uh, but the last time you played each other in a big international tournament, uh, and I'll stop sharing this now, uh, was ironically uh, we talked about the difficulty of getting WTA sanctioned tournaments in Argentina. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, you had to go all the way uh, to um, to Spain to play each other in a WCA sanctioned tournament. So um, the, the main bit the of footage... Day, I remember the day that the, oh. the, the, the um, seat came out. I remember it. I was taking a bus in the city center oh. and some friend called me like, 
Seller City and Dos Propuesto just got drafted against each other in, in La Coruña. And it was a huge mess because actually people were commenting on Facebook like, you cannot do this, you cannot mm -hmm. make two teams travel to like play themselves when they play like in the same city and the WFTDA was like, well, that's how the city turns out. We're sorry, we're going to look into it, but we can change it. And it was crazy. Yeah, they just made that whole traveling thing just to to, to play each other. It was... Uh, but it was, a very, it was a good game. I mean... It uh, was a good game. Yes, it was, but... But yes, you did have to travel halfway yeah. across the world to play. Ah. So. It means a lot to travel here. Our, our economic situation makes it so hard. And now that was like, we couldn't believe that that lack of our team here, the only two teams that could play were going to play and spend a lot of money to travel there. It, it was like, well, well. Um, yeah, oh, a Scottish call out, by the way. One of the officials uh, in the... Um, in the inside pack is is a well known Scottish official. So I should I should mention about your side being on being on on screen. But yes, um yeah, it was it was very strange. And I mean it's happened it happened to Australia a few times as well, as I'm sure you're aware, that they had to end up flying to the USA or Europe to play games in a continental. Play each other. Yeah, but not it's not quite I think they were playing other teams, so it's not quite as bad as what happened to Dos Quattro and Sailor City. Yeah, I mean um, yeah, here they go to play other teams, but mm -hmm. I mean, your, your first eliminatory seed at the end of the day is against like another Argentinian team, and that's like we could have done that in Buenos Aires and don't don't spend half of like three salaries yeah. to get there. And I and remember that. Yeah. I only three. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, but just like the teams, and I remember that the the time they traveled this this uh, trip, this playoff trip, the dollar in Argentina made the huge jump as usual but you get some periods yeah you get some periods when the dollar goes like four pesos in two hours and teams and i think there was Sarah city or uh, someone i was talking about they were like we took the plane with the dollar on 40 and we arrived to spain with the dollar on 50. I think that happened again uh, the next year, didn't it? Because it affected yes. both you and Dos Pocotra going to um, your respective tournaments then as well. Yes. Uh, yes. There it went from 50 to 60. Yeah. So what is it like at the moment? I mean, I assume it's worse now because COVID-19 is affecting every, every country? Or is it... Um, Right now, dollar, and I, I, I think I, I talk, I'm going to shut up in a bit, I swear, I'm going to let everyone else talk. Uh, I talk about this in the podcast uh, mm -hmm. with, with Magical Willism, but I mean, right now, the government has put a tax into the dollar. Mm -hmm. So the dollar right now is uh, 70, okay, seven, 70 pesos is one dollar. You can only buy up to $200 a month. <laughs> And every time you buy them, you get a 30% tax. So the dollar is 70 on the bank, but to buy it, you get billed 93. So it's a power, it's parity basically, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And it, this gets applied to your credit card. If you buy a, a plane ticket, if you buy currency, if you exchange currency, so you have the limit in one side and in the other side, you have the tax. So like the, the actual money that you have to get dollars, it just like shrinks every time and it's more difficult. And then you have to go to the black market to get dollars. And I mean, if a dollar is 92, 93 in the bank, in the black market is 120. Yeah. So traveling is pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. She doesn't say in gear is so expensive. Well, we have to, yeah. have to buy, to, I don't know, to buy some, I don't know, the smallest thing in our derby gear. And it's like really painful to try to pay for that. Yes, my, my knee pads are broken. I had to buy one and I really <laughs> don't want to. Is it all important? <laughs> are you, is everything imported from the USA or from... Or is there, are there local skate providers in Argentina? We have a very good uh, local skate, but the rest of the year we, we have to, you know, 
import. So it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And it's just and also in Argentina, it's very expensive to do like, and this is important regarding that there are a lot of people from other cities here. In Argentina, it's really expensive to do intercity traveling, like yes. traveling to Cordoba, to Shuaya, yeah. or to Jujuy. It's really expensive, like yeah. inside traveling. So teams that have to come to Buenos Aires to compete because they don't have as much teams in their cities, they really can do it like once or twice a year because it's super super expensive and i think uh, manuela and Sara and karen can talk about this more than me but in inside travel in argentina is really really expensive like really expensive absurdly expensive and not just that you know if we want to go to Ushuaia, we have to you know consider uh, taking two planes because uh, we don't have a, a straight uh, flight you know from to there or we have to take a bus from my hometown to hers, uh, to, to Manu, and it's approximately it? 48, yes. 48 so hours. <laughs> it's a lot. From Jujuy to Soya, I think we have like four, four days. Yeah. Or three and a half days, I think, traveling. We have, I don't know how many. Uh, I don't know how much we are so far between our cities, but four travel days are coming. Another four going back. <laughs> I know. So it's a it's a really big investment of time to obviously, and again, Argentina is bigger than I think people imagine it being. So you actually are traveling a large distance there as well because um, you're traveling oh what two thirds of the length of the country or something. To get from Hui to um, to Vishaya? it's the whole country. It's yeah. like the, the northest to the southest, and actually yeah. to get to Suaya, you have to get into if you go by car, you have to get into Chile and get into Suaya because you don't <laughs> have like really you have to do like Argentina, Chile, Chile, and then you go back to Suaya because you don't have like a direct route, so you just you have to exit the country and enter the country. Uh, Google yes. Maps says that it's uh, 47 hours of uh, traveling. <laughs> yes, I think I think a lot of people find that hard. To, I mean, certainly people in Europe find that hard to imagine, right? Because it's it is no, it is never that long to travel between any two countries in Europe. It's you know, it's a few hours at best, at worst. So, it's and a big you have like trains mm. or like high speed stuff. Here's like your car or a bus or very few airlines, very few, like two or three airlines, but two-ish. Yes, and I don't know, I think that there are four flights. Yeah. No, two, no, N no one, <laughs> there are none. But, well, <laughs> normal time in a year, this time we have two days flights and no more. Two flights and that's all. So. But it's obviously, as you say, um, the reason why everyone wants to hold their own tournament is because they would like to, you know, get other people to travel for a little bit. Um, but um, have you also, I mean, given where Hui is and where Buenos Aires is, uh, there's obviously the temptation to play people from the countries across your border. Because as you mentioned, I mean, Chil the Chilean border is not that, is, has a bunch of teams on either side of it. And obviously, Buenos Aires is just across uh, the um, well, Uruguay. the estuary to from um, Uruguay and sort of Brazil, really, if you go on the side. So, is there a lot of um, inter inter country games or not? Uh, uh, speaking from Buenos okay. Aires, at least, no. I mean, no. Metropolitan, which is the team from Santiago de Chile came to VA last year, like April ish. And they had because they had they needed to play some strength factor challenges games to get into the ranking and they played with Cyber City. We had some sanctioned games there. Uh, but then at least in Buenos Aires, you sometimes have the teams from Uruguay, which are uh Pajaros Pintados and Tempestal, mm -hmm. who come like take the ferry, the bus, uh, to Buenos Aires to play some tournaments, 
Brazil has been a long gone from our scene. Uh, they came to a violent tango, the last violent tango that was a WFTDA recognized tournament. And that's it. You, I mean, at least in Buenos Aires, and I'm always talking from Buenos Aires because I'm not going to over talk any other city. From Buenos Aires, we haven't been getting uh, many inter-border tra- uh, teams apart from this very specific bit- visit from Metropolitan for these uh, games. And uh, Tempestada and Pajaros Pintados, which are kind of like usual in some tournaments or some scrimmages. But apart from that, it's not much. I don't know how it is for another uh, cities who are closer to the borders with Chile. Yeah, we are closer to, uh, for example, uh, Bolivia and Peru, but um, Bolivia doesn't have a roller derby team that we are aware of. They don't, and, as I know, I don't know. <laughs> and Peru, uh, the travels from Peru, uh, you have to go to Buenos Aires, so it's like, it's the same. Now, I, I talked to Toxiclima um, earlier on this year, and they were saying how difficult it is for them to get anywhere because I think it's even worse than perhaps it is for Argentina because they, you know, everyone is far away from them. So, but um, I think there was talk of a team starting in Ecuador, but that may or may not actually be okay now because of COVID 19. But would Ecuador have been better for you in, in Hawaii? A little it, closer. It, it's a bit closer, yes. Uh, but we have to, you know, uh, go by bus. We don't have a like um, a flight, so I don't know how long it's gonna take that. But I can, I can go. I really like. I really, I really would like to know, you know, Ecuador. Yeah, I think they've been they've they've been in one of those situations where they've been trying to start a team for so long that there have been various people trying to start teams, but never quite getting there to actually getting a game for years. So hopefully it'll happen at some point. Um, because, I mean, um, as you were saying, I mean, even in, in a lot of, uh, of the Argentine cities we're talking about, you've had more or less teams over time, right? It fluctuates, it goes up and down. So uh, I think they were having an even worse problem. Uh, so I guess I mean, we've talked about the economy and about the exchange rate as a problem for Argentine roller derby but I mean I also want to talk about positive things so what, are the, what, what positive things do you think we if you wanted to sell Argentine roller derby or roller derby in your city to people what would you say is a good a, the positive sides of Argentine roller derby um, I think we are so few and we know a lot you know, like uh, we uh, we know uh, people from Ushuaia, we know people from Tucumán, from La Rioja, so we can you know make these things like uh, talk to from north to south. That's I I really like that. I know people from all provinces and cities, and I I don't think I would have done that if I if it wasn't for roller derby. I think to sell this, we could say that in our country, in another teams in the world were thinking to come here and play in, in some Argentinian tournament. I would say that they will really be surprised here because it's a really, well, we told it, we said that before, but it's a really big country and you had a lot to know here. We, you have, I don't know, you have, uh, the Patagonia or we, you have in Jujuy and, and you have I don't know some valleys there like uh, in, in Salta and you have a lot of places here to know and well you have a lot of teams here and a lot of people to uh, to share this and um, well I think that was that would be really we had a, a very small uh, like car cell uh, well now uh, a small community, but we are a lot of people that, well, we love to share it, uh, this sport, this, this community, and our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place, uh, you know, all, all over the country. So that would be, well, it's cheap here, and you have a lot to know, and to, and, well, to, 
to explore. <laughs> and Buenos Aires is a really, really beautiful place. Uh, well, Jujuy, all Argentina. I think that is really... Yeah, yeah. It's very touristic. Yes. But is that um, is that also a problem? I mean, you say it's a it's very touristy, but does that give people a, is that part of the? I don't know. I think there's a tendency for people perhaps to think about places being touristy and just just touristy. Because uh, I mean, you have Argentina has other things other than people coming to see how beautiful it is, right? I think it's an advantage. I don't know if it's a bad thing. I always use tourism like as a leverage for people. Like, <laughs> come to an event in Argentina because it's like super pretty, and people actually don't don't. Sometimes they don't realize how pretty it can get, and I'm just being like, I'm gonna take the flag in any moment. But really, it's super super pretty, and it, every time it happens to me a lot on Twitter. Like, I'm I'm on Derby Twitter and talking with people, and I, I we're like we're gonna have the tournament next week. Here and I show you a picture from Ushuaia, from Jujuy, from Sierra de Córdoba, from uh, Bariloche, and people are like, "That looks like Switzerland," and like, mm. "It's not Switzerland; it's in Argentina, and it's like 93 times cheaper than Switzerland." Yes, that's that's what that's what I wanted to say. Here is cheap, and you <laughs> here in the window and watching the mountains. So well, yeah, I, I mean know. it's like way cheaper and you have forests, you have uh, uh, waterfalls, mountains, south, north, hot, you have everything. And it's like 9,000 times cheaper than Europe or uh, Switzerland, whatever, Canada, Sweden-ish. And don't get me wrong, I love it. I, I was just, I've been in England in, in just mm. like some months ago and it's, it's a beautiful place, but we're also pretty. Yeah, <laughs> we're also pretty. We're also pretty. So, how much how much luck have you had getting people to travel to Argentina from, say, the Americas? Because I know, obviously, uh, Ushaya did manage to get Grand City to travel, but I don't think there's been a lot of other American teams travel down to Argentina. Um, Latin American, not much. We I mean, had. We had the New York Shock Exchange in 2016 for the hard tournament. We've had Metropolitan sometimes. We've had Bogota One Breakers. We've had um, Toxic Lima twice, NBA at least. Great City Rebels, Brazil. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We never had, I think we never had Mexico. I'm super interested in officiating Mexican roller derby. I think um, it's interesting because when we did the Mexican vodcast uh, just uh, a, a few weeks ago, they were commenting on how they can never get teams to visit them from anywhere else in the Americas. So I think you might have the same problem. Uh, yes. Um, but I mean, again, I mean, Mexico is further away than people think it is from Argentina as well. So there's still a bit of travel to do. But um, it would be, I mean, I suppose being political, would you rather build up a Latin American derby connections uh, as then make Latin American derby as a whole stronger? Or would you focus on Argentina if you were building up, taking people places? Um, oh. Because, I mean, Latin America is huge, right? So it's really expensive to travel around all of Latin America. I would really love to see Latin American Union in Derby. I would love to see. Because I think it's a statement. It's not only, like, a convenient because it's close. Because I'm going to be honest with you, traveling to Mexico is as expensive as traveling to the U.S. So at the end of the day, you can just travel to the U.S. if you're going to do it for a ranking point or whatever. Uh, I mean, hell, traveling to Brazil is expensive. Traveling to Chile is expensive. Uh, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a statement. Like Latin American unity, it's a statement. It's important. And I, I'm also with the same. My biggest dream is to have a Latin American Continental Cup. 
like European, North America, West, East, whatever, European, Australia, what? And I really would, I don't want to retire from Derby. I'm not thinking to it, but I don't want to leave Derby without seeing a Latin American Continental Cup happening. And I think that a, a big pathway to that is Latin American unity, like with teams, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, Peru, uh, whoever, Costa Rica has a team, Panama, whoever has a country, just like come, come together. Because I think that Argentina already has the, 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 the pillars, you know? You have teams at the WFTDA, you have a, a team in the top 10, we're seeing them right now playing playoff. That's it. Now we just have to build like the Latin American community. And I'm going to shut up and let everyone else talk. I always <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, not that, but you know, something similar. I would love to see, uh, oh, I would love to show everyone else that Latin America has a very, it's a, uh, how you say, uh, potencia. Potential, yeah. Yeah, a, a very yeah has a very good potential in Rolo Derby, not just Argentina, just you know, Tox Lima, the girls from Chile. I think uh, we we can show uh, a lot of that. I would love to, you know. But if you have potential, what's holding you back? Is it is it the economy? Are there other things yeah. that you would? Focus? I think I wanted to add that I think that it's economy first of all because we are in Latin America uh, aren't have a good, aren't having a good time. Well, here in Argentina we are not the only ones. Chile has been fighting uh, for their rights and their economy, and I think everywhere here we there is so uh, so expensive to to travel and to well to spend that kind of money, even though we can. I don't know, offer, uh, well, beds for, for sleeping, just only the ticket planes. Uh, there's so much amount of money that it's it makes it so hard here to try to do that. Uh, I think that, well, we're here in Australia, we can't travel to Buenos Aires more than once or twice a year because we have to sell pizzas and everything else to just to go twice in a year. So I think like thinking of traveling Chile or Chile or I don't know, Costa Rica is like really, really far for, uh, for a corner. So I think that is a regional uh, task. Please, so. mm, but see, but I, I mean, when you mentioned Chile fighting for their rights, I mean, they were fighting for their rights as well. I mean, Chile had this political issue as well as a, an economic issue because, and I mean, we 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 shared a lot of uh, metropolitans um, metropolitan roller derby. We're actually sharing a lot of updates on the situation in Chile last year. Uh, so, do you think there's also though a political angle? Because I know that the Brazilian teams have been having both economic and political issues. Because obviously, their government is not the best government you could have. Uh, so, is there also a political aspect to this? Do you feel and do you feel roller derby, in some ways, is a good response to that kind of thing because well there be itself is of course politically charged in some ways i mean do you have a feeling about that i think that yes well last year there were there were two teams two uh, teams from chile that were going to come here to patagonia to calafate to participate in a tournament and they had to cancel that because they were having uh, like this political thing, political uh, disturbs and well, that kind of thing that we all know about Chile last year. So I think that is really, we are like, uh, yes, this is a political thing because you have to, to do in, in your out of government uh, thinking or like trying to work with that both ways that like Maki said when we started talking, uh, we had the same issues that is being uh, really uh, influenced by the actual politicians. And I mean, Mother Davi is eminently politic. Yes. I mean, politic, I always say this, Maybe. something being political is not bad. That there's, there's sometimes this 
whole idea that if it's political, it's bad. And I mean, roller derby, it's political because mm. it's a it's a revolutionary sport in every way. In every way, it takes gender expansion, um, ideas. It, it it everything is really like intertwined together. So the political climate of your um, of your country and especially in Latin America where we have such a special politics and they're so heavily influenced with a, such a heavy influence from the, the central countries. So yeah, it, it, it is political and it sometimes how your country is standing politically here in South America and Latin America, it, it affects directly your, your daily life and, and whether you're gonna be able to keep on doing derby or not. And I think Chile, had the biggest um, example of that because they didn't stop training because they didn't want to. They didn't stop training because they were literally protesting basic rights in the street and getting blinded by the police in the process. Like that's no, that's not a joke. It's a big deal. Yes, being hated. Yeah, but I mean, you. I, I, I suppose it sort of makes the political aspect of it be more serious in a way, because obviously there is lots to be done in Europe involving the things that Roller Derby represents politically. But perhaps in a lot of European countries, we are a lot closer to where you might want to be than perhaps we are in, for example, Chile, where again people literally had to protest for their rights, and in Brazil and to a certain extent in Argentina, right? Um, so do you think it makes it more, the political aspect, more important for the Royal Derby to you? The fact that it's, there's more to be done? Does Royal Derby feel more political? Or does, does the political aspect of Royal Derby feel uh, more important? This is my to, this to, personal to, opinion, sense. yes. I think that, this is super personal, yes. I think that like uh, politics, course, in, yeah. politics in Latin America and South America get handled very differently than the Europe sometimes or the US and we feel it different and we protest differently and yeah I mean I put in an example like a roller derby here is heavily um, uh, intertwined with, with what is the fight for a legal right to have abortion and you know, they really, they really go hand in hand. And I think it's amazing because you go to an event and you see skaters with the green, the green um, in, handkerchief that I don't have anyone here. And, and I think that, yeah, it, it gets crossed. Uh, it really gets crossed in Derby for us differently and the rest of the countries. But yes, I'm speaking from my side. I don't know what Manuela, Karen, Karen have their opinions about. I I agree. I think uh, uh, you know, and to us, at least in my team, uh, we our, our team it's roller derby and feminist by hand. You know, they go by hand. So uh, it's it's impressive to us. It's very political too. And does this? Uh, I guess does this affect how you recruit and how how people respond to roller derby? Because I think. It was a period when World Derby started off in the UK, certainly when there was a bit of, oh God, of people being the conservative press being horrified by women hitting each other, right? But is this a thing in, in, in Argentina? Do you get people being surprised by Derby being a contact sport with women or are we past that? And is it a more, is it a different, a different reaction you get to the sport from people who don't play? No that's that's the one you know they you know they don't like it they seem uh in my family it's like whoa what's that they you know it's it's hard <laughs> so how do you recruit then when you have um uh, this kind of um you know entrenched feeling perhaps about about your sport is it difficult do you have to find different ways to um advertise or Um, I don't know. I heard the you know the the girls from Chat Noir, uh, a team from Buenos Aires, 
was talking about, you know, recruitment and how it's so difficult. And we have like that same problem. You recruit and you can, um, you know, 10 people come to the meeting, but you end up uh, teaching uh, two or three people, not, not, not that much. It's kind of like hard. But do you feel that, I mean, do you feel that's because of the perception of roller derby or just because people just don't hang around? Is it a people thing or is it a roller derby thing? No, I think it's a people thing. Well, I, don't, you know, I don't know, you know, the rest. Yeah. Well, I can say that both. <laughs> well, uh, we here in Spaya, we're, we're a, a little people, a little bunch of people here, just in the city and, well, in our team too. <laughs> and, it, uh, well, we can, or we, we have a, a much people coming here trying to learn if we are playing, but playing is so hard because we don't have uh, anyone to play with, uh, with, with. So we have to make our tournament. But when we make our tournament, we have a lot of people trying to begin uh, and, and well work there. Like we we make this city move a little and we are, we are in everywhere <laughs> in our radios and tv <laughs> programs and in i don't know in the newspapers and so people started uh, starting asking and then well we have much people coming and trying to start the sport but well the rest of the year it's uh scar said uh, it's like difficult and we we end with two or three people in a month or two months and then it's hard to make them uh, like be part of because uh, you have uh, like two or three levels at the same time in the same team but you don't have enough uh, kind of uh, people to try to make I don't know three teams or like d different uh, uh, Times, no, times, no, I don't know. So it's like difficult and it's both because of people who said that it's like a contact sport and like how is Roger Derby and because we are women hitting, but then there are a lot of people that really love that and as Maki said before, it's like a very uh, sense and very uh, feminist sport and well, yes, there are a lot of people that don't, doesn't want that, but that's what I personally love about this, that we are trying to make our community uh, better and we are trying to make our, uh, like this, no, political thing about being in a roller derby team and trying to, uh, well, being, uh, like, well, feminist and abortion and that with our rights so I love that and how is it in Cordoba um, do you have um, how is your group in Cordoba do you find it's a, it's a problem or not yes it's, I think that it's the same as she mentioned before uh, here we have the same problem because uh, sometimes we have like 20 20 new people uh, and then they just, I don't know, we can't keep just one or two because I think that the main problem is that um, people consider roller derby as something recreational, as I said before, and they just go like, girls skating, they are just skating and I can do that and they come to practice and they just do not think that they can do it or they don't feel comfortable or they don't um, have this feminist feminism thing, you know. And we, as, as they mentioned before, we're trying to make roller derby a safe space and in a political way. And there are lots of people that don't fit in, let's say, with yeah, this so thing. I mean, would you mind talking more about that? Because I mean, so obviously there's lots of there's lots of ways in which you can make a space a safe space. So mm -hmm. what are you what is what are the challenges then from your perspective about making 
making um, your league a safe space? Well, there are many topics that could be related to this. For example, respecting different genders. There are people that do not do it. And sometimes we consider that we can have people that do not respect genders of others, for example, in our team. And it's not just a, a fight or a big argument with people that do not think the same, but they just do not feel comfortable in our team, for example. Not particularly in our team, but in Roland Derby. Mm -hmm. Probably we do not share the same thoughts, and more or less. So would you that say could be an example. Yeah, so would you say this is a political progressiveness problem? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, it sounds like part of the problem, what you're talking about here is about matching people's, uh, yeah, people's progressiveness, perhaps not matching that of Roller well Derby. Because Roller well mm -hmm. Derby is, Roller well Derby is quite progressive, I think. I mean, even in Europe, Roller well Derby is quite progressive in a lot of its, its thought processes. And there are parts of Europe that like to think of themselves as being very progressive. So, um, mm -hmm. so, and we have problems I mean, in the UK and um, there are people who have been uncomfortable, people have been uncomfortable having a role of Delhi because they perhaps have not been entirely as progressive as we'd like them to be. So is this really the, mm -hmm. is this really the issue? Is this a... It could feel? be. I mean, we are not close to having other types of uh, beliefs, let's say, in our team or in Roller Derby in general, but uh, we feel more comfortable with some kind of uh, people or... I, I, I'm not being able to express it in a way that I would like to do it, <laughs> but it's more or less like that. Yeah, there's a, there's I think a, that in Spanish could sound better. <laughs> I, I, yes, I mean... If my if my Spanish was in any way as good as your English, then we would have this conversation in Spanish. But my Spanish is terrible. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a thing called the paradox of tolerance, which I think applies here. There's the idea that you don't have to tolerate people being intolerant to be tolerant. Because, exactly. Exactly. Um, intolerant people, you know, harm more people than your being intolerant of does. So. Um, I think that's what we're sort of heading towards. Um, and do you feel there's a lot of education to be done? Is that a thing that Roller Derby does that you have to do in your leagues, perhaps? Or you feel you need to do to, to promote? I and mean, we've talked before about, for example, ab abortion rights and the, the fact that, that that's a political thing that is being, that a lot of Roller Derby leagues are pushing for. But do you think in general, one of the jobs Roller Derby does is to is to perhaps promote a more pro a more progressive political agenda in lots of ways or do you yeah. do yes i think that there are lots of topics that are not even um, considered in other sports that we talk about every day in roller derby for example the abortion thing that you mentioned in roller derby we have lots of um teams that posted something on Instagram, for example, when when there were the elections and etc. That, for example, in soccer, that is the most important or the most famous sport here in Argentina. They didn't even even mention a thing about it. That's true. Yes. So uh, yeah. So I mean. I guess we're talking about the topic, but yes, so this is obviously an important thing to roller derby, but mm -hmm. do you, is there any other, are there other topics you feel that you need to do that are difficult in roller derby, that the roller derby does differently or wants to promote in Argentina that perhaps people don't take seriously? What would you, what would be your, your things you'd improve in Argentina if you could to make roller derby spirit more accepted? I think uh, last year in the, uh, 2008, uh, it was a, a, a time uh, where a lot of changes in teams and structures and roller derby in Argentina uh, yeah. ha were happening. And it's, uh, it, it changed, uh, you know, the, 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 the leagues and, you know, the, 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 the female teams, the male teams, it changed a lot. And because we, I think we all had this conversation, like 
you know, we are not toler we are not going to tolerate this. Uh, from now on, you know, uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to make this better. You know, uh, it was um, it was a very I don't know how to say it, but it changed uh, a lot of of roller derby in Argentina. Yeah, I think I think from outside Argentina that wasn't very visible because I think a lot of the time things that happen in uh, in other countries people don't notice. Uh, but I mean I picked up on some of that um, and some of the discussions that went on. Um, I don't know if you want to mention, go into any more detail about that or if it's something you don't you just want to mention as a thing that happened. I know there was a lot of conversations that happened. Um, but um, yes, I, I'm aware that there was a big change in in what people. Do you think it's improved since? I mean, has the has having the conversation helped matters? At least in our league, where we know you, know, we have two teams. We have Mortal Goyas, uh, the female team, and Coquenas Fighters, the, the the male team. Um, I think the guys, uh, we're, we're all having this conversation, you know, this is happening, this is what we want to do now. Um, they say, you know, yes, we, we're, we, we are with you with, with these decisions, you know, it's, it's whatever, you, whatever you consider it's better because it's going to be safer and, you know, it's going to be better, uh, it's going to be a, a safe spacer for you. So, you know, we, we really like that. We we uh, we have the support. Is that something I think that, that I, if if I can say anything yeah. or add something to that, I think that uh, every problem or I don't know how to say it or everything that make us think uh, or that made us think uh, as we did and try to make things change, it's like. Uh, uh, leveling thing. I think that that is trying to change things and we are uh, like that that now that is our, our chatting thing and our, in our teams we are talking about this and try I how to solve these problems and how to uh, what can we do what uh, what can uh, or how can we deal with some different things is really positive because it makes us all the all teams think about how solving this and how making new uh, things to try to make it better or to being safer or feeling more comfortable so i think that is positive everything that like make us think or change and try to do or make a better community is positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I mean, it's easy if everyone agrees that they're going to improve. So um, uh, I guess in a sense, I'm, we're talking to leagues that are happy and have talked to other leagues that are improving, right? But um, I mean, how, how do you persuade people to improve if they're not going to improve, I guess? Has there been a problem? Have there been leagues that have not got with the program? Um, I think, that, you know, the, the people who have time to, to adapt to this uh, new paradigm, it didn't, didn't survive. Mm -hmm. In, so it's, you know, that's what happened. I mean, I, I think that it, it's been getting like, you know, it's not a choice anymore. Like you, you don't get to to pick if you respect someone's pronouns. You don't get to pick if if I mean if your grievance committee in your league is like we've had an abuse situation and this person is gonna get banned for the, from the team. You don't get to pick. I mean, you don't get to job the victim. You don't get to pick mm -hmm. anyone's pronouns. And I, in my case, at least being an official and speaking from the official side. We have been doing a lot of work, you know, from because it's really important. We've been doing a lot of a lot of work because it's really important when you're giving a captain's talk or an efficient talk. Like we're not going to use the masculine uh, pronoun as a general rule because we're not going to do that. Why would we do that? We don't have people here 
who identify by masculine pronouns and we have non-binary people and you don't get to pick that. And Rada Derby has been doing a lot of education on that in a sense. And I think it's wonderful. And I think I think it's one of the biggest talks we've have we've had in 2018 is the thing like pronouns, uh, gender binary, non-binaries. And I, it's it's great. Oh my god, I love that. I love Derby. <laughs> Is that is that harder in Spanish? Because I mean, as an English speaker, obviously, it is already slightly controversial amongst the kind of people you don't we wouldn't approve of to use they because it's it's a genderless pronoun, but it's also a plural, and some people like to split hairs. But does Spanish have a gender neutral animate pronoun? Mm. Yes, all of it. <laughs> it's todas, todos, y todes. It's, it's kind of hard because uh, uh, verbal conjunction is it's hard, it's mm. more complicated, but you, you, you do the effort so people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. and In my job, for example, or on my, or my school, they don't use it at all, they don't understand it, they don't like it, but you know, in my role at every community, it, you, we do. And is that now a standard thing? Do we all agree that this is now this is now a standard thing in Argentine roller derby that we're all using the um, yeah. yes. I, I mean I think that yes, you you don't get I, I you don't get to pick. Okay. Like because everyone knows someone who identifies as non binary. Yeah. So you just go with the run like you just go with like we here we call it inclusive language. That's the name it gets here, language inclusivo, which is the E to replace A or E or O. Mm -hmm. And it's just obvious. I mean, I don't even write anymore when I'm writing the in Derby. I don't I just go with todes, nosotres, eche, juntes, because it's like you don't get to pick. As soon as one person is excluded from your, your wording, it's wrong. So you just don't get to pick. Like... Uh, again, I think this is an interesting way in which Royal Derby is perhaps the, the political, the, the positive political side of Royal Derby is a positive thing, right? Because there aren't, there are perhaps few other sports that would have deliberately decided to embrace an inclusive language that was perhaps controversial or at least new seen as a neologism in their in their in their country right because it, it it marks you out as being as caring about a thing that perhaps other people care less about right yes definitely so um i guess i want to make Mackie speak a bit more. Um, I know she doesn't want to speak a bit more, but I remembered that a thing I haven't asked about that was happening in Argentina was uh, about officials, because we've talked about how many skaters you have, but how many officials are there in your leagues? Because uh, oh. I... <laughs> There's Mackie. <laughs> and... <laughs> and Mackie. Yeah. And Mackie. No, uh... Every, I mean, everyone here has been an official sometime. I know it. God, you've yeah. been an official. Manny, you've been an official. Karen, you've been an official? Yes. yes. <laughs> Everyone's been an official. You <laughs> to be an official. You want to play, you're going to be an official. Actually, when we had the tournament in Ushuaia last year, and Manuela helped with this, yes. you're had to provide three officials and if you didn't provide them for the tournament you'd get points taken out of your final uh your final score yes, like, I like that, that was that was a part of our our how, how do you say contrato how do you say when in okay. yeah. the tournament <laughs> said that you had to provide three officials because we didn't have officials at all no. Like I had days where I didn't, I did four or five games, like all one next to each other and I didn't have time to eat because we didn't have officials. So yes. in Ushuaia, it was really, it was part of the contract. And when 
we finished the tournament, she, Manuela came to me and she was like, tell me what team didn't get any officials because we're going to take the points out, out of them. Because you have to, like, officiating here is difficult. There are not many officials who are just officials. Most officials play. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't play and I don't know many officials who are just, like, full-time refs or full-time not getting officials or full-time whatever. Um, and not much people get to be full-time skaters either because they end up officiating eventually. I mean, guard yes. is here has officiated tournaments in which she has played with me yes. she's been like a scoreboard operator for me and the next game she was playing and she played like finals like that manu too like mm -hmm. it and officiating is a officiating is a problem because uh there are not much um you know people don't people don't want to learn to officiate they want to learn to skate and they want to be jammers and blockers and pivots and and all the fancy stuff of roller derby and the truth is that you're not gonna look fancy as a jammer if you don't have anyone to officiate your game yes because your game is just not gonna happen ever if you don't get officials Yes, when I started uh, uh, in rural derby, I I didn't, you know, I I, I wasn't, you know, uh, very sure of, of playing, but I really kind of like fell in love with the with the official part, and I learned it, and I study, and I actually officiate everything that I can, and it's so hard to, you know, not be, not put myself in that part, you know, it's like I always end up doing official stuff. And so now I'm studying and I want to get the certification so no one can tell me that I'm wrong. That, that's what the official, that's what the WTA official certification means. It means that you are always right. We, we know this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got Thank a pass. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's also been a bunch of, I'm thinking back to last year, there was a bunch of uh, officiating clinics along the coast, uh, south of Buenos Aires, I think, to try and build up more officials as well. Is that a thing that's been, it feels like a thing that's got more attention in the last couple of years. Is that, a, is that true? Um, Mar del Plata start doing, started doing, Mar del Plata is like the biggest main beach city in Buenos Aires, like beach, Mar del Plata, it's like correlation, direct correlation, and they have a really beautiful team, it's called MD and the Queens, and Cobra Quads, which is their MRDA team, and they started doing like some clinics, but I, I think it was like a summerish thing, and it, it didn't, uh, trust like you know kept on going which is terribly sad mm -hmm. we try to hold uh, officiating clinics when we go to tournaments if the teams give us like a day or space i was i was uh, lucky enough to to host one in Ushuaia when we went last year um i was going to be part of one in mendoza and my flight was delayed and i never got to the clinic <laughs> it was hosted without me <laughs> because my flight got delayed um but I mean, at least Buenos Aires, uh, this, this year in March, we had a visit from Jens, Jens Hatcher, who is in this game that we're seeing right now, he's a jammer ref in this game. And we had his visit in BA and it was the most wonderful, nurturing thing ever. We had a, like a four hour long session and we tried to provide streaming and we had some problems and we're, we, we recorded it and we're gonna like send it over to, to teams and and it was beautiful because we got to learn so much from someone who knows so much and it also makes you sad a little bit because and in this is my case I, I remember leaving the clinic being terribly happy for all that I had, I had learned but also terribly sad because it's like, oh my God, I want to have all these experiences that he has. I want to tell you about that time and about what I learned in the playoffs and what I learned in the Continental Cups and what I learned like that time I went to 
officiate to whatever fancy place and it makes you like feel a lot of longing for that mm. and it, it's sad sometimes but i'm i'm thankful that we have people who want to come and tell us what they know because sometimes you feel like in a stump i i feel in a stump sometimes because it's like i'm teaching a lot of people but i'm not learning mm -hmm. because i'm always doing the same level games with the same teams i learned a lot when i went to the world cup mm -hmm. because it was the world cup and so when you get visits from someone who knows so much we had visits from intergil a uh, danger muffin uh gens and they just bring you all that knowledge and it's like oh my god i want to know all of this i want it's like like the little mermaid song mm -hmm. like i want to be part of your world <laughs> <laughs> yes i left the clinic feeling like the little mermaid like oh, i want to be part of that officiating fancy world <laughs> but it is different as you say i mean partly geographically right because obviously again european teams are just denser more densely distributed so it's easier to get more exciting officiating things or even not exciting well, here, <laughs> here in Ushuaia we don't have officials well mm. we are a few I have uh, some partners that officiate as Mikey said but we don't have enough to, to just to do anything here we we have to invite uh, people to come here because we can't run again uh, otherwise so uh, we here when we organize our tournament we try to uh, to make them feel comfortable and they went well we gave them some space to where, where, where they can, where they can sleep and trying to fit them just as they were in our houses and try to spend time with them and try to make them feel happy of being here and participate because it's like well, it's a community and we it's like a very beautiful and lovely feed up when you can share well all you all that you have here uh, is cars I don't know how, how do you say excursion yeah like trips like trips like touristic trips that you have mm -hmm. they have access when we went to Ushuaia, like uh, Manuela's team, they got us actual discounts to go see uh, natural attractions. So we would go like on, on groups to the glacier to take a ferry to see a lighthouse and it was super fun. I want to go I next time. That... <laughs> yes. You see, it's working. We are all invited here to come <laughs> to our next, <laughs> our next tournament. But well, that we are really with our, our uh, I don't know, our doors are always open just to share a train with anywhere, anyone from anywhere. So, well, we have visits from Germany and we have visits from France. Everyone, everyone who came here and passed from the, <laughs> the informed tourism, informed, uh, we had a teammate that works there and well, she's always telling, we have a roller derby team here. Come to train with us. We can share your all of that gear you need. Come, play with us. And if you are, if you want to share, if you want to, I don't know, come here with our tournament or anywhere, in anywhere in the time, we are always trying to share and make it like a, well, sharing thing and that kind of stuff. So, so how many, roughly how many skaters do you have? We talked about how you've done very many skaters, but how many skaters roughly are there in the Shire? Now, <laughs> well, now we, we, well, I think we are in Piratas del Vigil. I think we are kind of 10. Okay. And, and then the boys of Bandera Negra are like five mm. now because we are we have stopped in november mm. and we have some venue issues and they were going to give us back our 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 venue and then well this uh, epidemic uh, sub <laughs> came and we couldn't start skating so uh, 
last time we skated was, I don't know, in January. Right. <laughs> but, okay. well, so I don't know really how much of us are, are going to be capable of training our bodies again and try to rebuild our, our body to play roller derby. I don't know. But when you were, so last year, before, so before January, how many were you, how many are you normally? Normally we had been like uh, 18 uh, okay. in the whole day, in training, training, sorry. 18 okay. people were 15, like that. So did you ever consider, I mean, we've been talking here um, mostly about WHTA standard rules games, right? Did you ever consider playing shorter format games like Roller Derby 7s, which would have, because you could play a 7s game just with all the skaters you had, right? But you, you're talking about short track? Or track no, or I'm, talking about, I'm talking about Roller Derby 7s. Uh, seven, oh. team, seven, team, seven skaters a team, 21 minutes, one period, otherwise the same as WTJ rules. Here we we what well we are fifteen and we play an hour. <laughs> yeah. In two teams, one is eight people and another seven, and we train and we play an hour an hour. And then when well last year in November, Usuario Roller Derby as a mixed team uh, with the both teams that trains uh, were were to travel to Calafate to play on. Um, and a small tournament that made uh, the Calafate League there. So, and we were playing, but all together, the 15 of us were playing there. So, <laughs> that was like, we always are trying to get someone from another part of Argentina, try to, not to fool a roster, but just to be 10, 12, and try to can play just a little more. We had a, a thing that here in Ushuaia, we are in, in, in next to the sea. So, mm -hmm. uh, and in a really cold, cold place. So when we travel, uh, and there is, I know, I don't know, Buenos Aires uh, kind of weather, and we can't freeze. <laughs> and it's so hard to play because we can't stand uh, 25 uh, degrees, uh, it's like we are dying when we are skating. <laughs> and, and it's so, I think I really, I admire so much Mortal Kosha from Kukui. I can't believe they are training in th that kind of high places. I, I, I don't, I, I think I, if I travel to Kukui, I, I would be sleeping uh, when I started I will, so, I can't be. You can come so away like, earlier so you can acclimate yes. to, yes. <laughs> to <laughs> the high. But people think that we we train, you know, when when we ask, people think we train, you know, in the middle of the mountain. And we're not <laughs> we, in a venue. And to us, it's flat. I don't know. <laughs> and no, no, we have courts. Yeah, we do. You know, it's uh, we have. Uh, uh, how you say Calle oh, Havalda too? They think we have llamas. We travel with llamas. <laughs> <laughs> they keep telling us all the time. You don't. <laughs> as, 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 as us with the penguins. Mm. I don't have a penguin. A penguin as a pet in my. I don't have a pet penguin. <laughs> 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 I'm honestly surprised you, the, the two of you haven't just picked llamas and penguins as your league motto, uh, your league mascots, just to just to play with play with people's expectations. Um, <laughs> you've got to you've got to embrace a stereotype, right? If everyone thinks you have llamas, then have llamas and then make them underestimate we have... you. <laughs> We're gonna get one. Mm -hmm. Yes. But... <laughs> 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 <An alpaca. laughs> yes. I think we've just guaranteed that Mackie will come to whatever whatever yes. things you hold in. <laughs> yes. I need for the animals. I, I went to see so many animals in Australia. Like I went to every single excursion I could see like penguins, checks, 
birds check, uh, um, uh, seals check, whales check, check. I went to see everything. And I, I have never been to, I've never been to Jujuy and Salta, so I'm actually waiting for them to make something so I can go. Yeah, actually, we, we, I talked to you about coming here and you said, you know, if I can do tourism and stay a few days, yeah, I can go. I can get tourist, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't want to, I, if I can get three days from my work, I want to go. I was actually, I had a free week. I still have a week of holidays that I'm not going to be able to take because COVID-19. And I was like, I'm, I'm finally going to go to the north. I'm going to go to the north. And yeah, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> well, and you were also stuck in the UK for a while as well. So yeah, I was really stuck have. in the UK for three weeks, though. Yeah. So, um, you know, you survived that at least. Um, but it was fun. In UK, so it's a curious place to get to get in a lockdown. People are, are, are strange, are different. It was different. It was It's very different from lockdown in Argentina. Like, British lockdown and Argentinian lockdown are different. And it was it was a nice experience. Do they have penguins? What? Do they have penguins? No, they don't. They we are, have. We are far too north to have penguins. Yeah. Lots of squirrels. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we do have lots of squirrels. Oh. Yeah, it was so nice. I remember I would wake up and look through the kitchen window, and there was this tree, and I would see a squirrel going up and down, and get all excited, and yeah. Super third world, like I got excited for British squirrels. <laughs> you got to be worried. You got to you got to be careful with the British squirrels though, because everyone thinks they're cute, so everyone starts feeding them. So actually, squirrels, a lot of squirrels aren't frightened of people anymore because they just assume that they're food dispensers. So they're they're not frightened of you, and some of them will, you know, some of them will bite uh, and not run away from you. So you got to be careful, squirrels. Yeah, no, I but didn't get to the Sorry, that same thing happens here with foxes. In mm. when well, we go to excursions here, the foxes here are like very used to be fed from the tourist people, so they are next to the cars, sitting there, waiting their part. So <laughs> you can take a picture of a fox mm. just sitting there, hanging, so waiting yeah. some food, and that yes, that happens here. Outside. I, mean, I think it's probably less dangerous with the alpacas and the llamas um, up in um, Pahui. Um, the worst they're yeah. going to do is spit at you, right? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I know I've held you guys now for almost two hours. So I guess I want to, as a final topic, just to, to get things out, I want to talk about. Uh, I guess, obviously, everyone's plans for the year have changed radically because of COVID-19. But are there are there things that you either hope will happen in Argentine roller derby in the future, or you're working on happening that people people should look out for? I mean, I know it's dependent on COVID-19, but assuming there is time for anything to happen, or what happens next year, what what, what do you what is what is what do you is happening in Argentine roller derby in the future? We actually, uh, in our league, dream to, oh, we fantasize about, you know, trying to make a, a, a Latin America at least bring people from Chile or, you know, Brazil. Uh, we talked about, we almost make it a possibility, but we couldn't. So we we wanted that. If we really want to go south, that kind of, that was like our this year destiny. We talked to the girls and we said like, we want to go and they say we don't have a date confirmed because we don't have a venue yet so wait for that so we waited and you know everything else happened but yeah we always try to make a tournament but we don't succeed i think here we want to make our tournament again uh, and to make it happen and to make it bigger and to make more people uh, come here uh, and share this thing with us and I don't know try to to, uh, to grow try to feed that seed from Argentina and make it big 
um, that would be my, my most uh, big wish about what would or should be happening next just to make our tournament and try to to make it for more people and try to well move a little things from town <laughs> and Cordoba things for the future well we were going to do kind uh, kind of come back this year because we we couldn't play last year nor in 2019 so we were going to do a comeback this year and so i hope we hope that we could do it in a few in a few months just um, held a tournament or traveling play <laughs> we just want to play and i hope we could do that and Mackie in, in buenos aires or with any of your other hats Oh my God, I, you know, I saw the skate of the union yesterday and I was mm. so sad. So mm. sad because like, we're never going to play derby again, ever. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like, I mean, the, the program that WFTDA is, is rolling out is wonderful because it's really restrictive so people don't die, which is great. But then you read like, you need to have no social distancing plus 50 people gathering plus no positive COVID-19 cases for 14 days. And it's like, yeah. we are so far from that happening mm -hmm. ever. Yes. Like, you know, Argent Argentina, Argentina lockdown has six phases. Uh, the rest of the country is currently on phase four, which list Buenos Aires is still on phase three. And we've already had some smaller cities that went back to phase one. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like we we are flattening the curve, but it's starting to rise because things. And I'm talking from Buenos Aires because it's where I live. Things are starting to get bad, and people have been in lockdown two months, and they're starting to get tired of the lockdown, so they don't respect the lockdown. So they go out. All the cases go up. So when I I heard I I heard yesterday the state of the union, and I saw like no positive COVID-19 cases in 14 days straight. And if you get one case, you go back to ladder zero, to step zero. It's like, I'm, I have to find another hobby because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm my life going to do derby again. And it's terrible because right now, Buenos Aires is raking up like 200 cases a day, which is not much, but it's a number. And it's 200 cases while in lockdown, mm -hmm. you know, and people are starting to get out and we are starting to uh, make it more flexible and numbers are going up and people are dying. We're not, we don't have the numbers of Brazil or of uh, the UK or the United States, luckily. But so it, it, yesterday I saw the scale of the union. I was just like really sad. I went to sleep like really like, we're never going to play derby again. Um, and it's, it's, it's sad. It, it makes me sad. And I don't know what to hope for derby in the, in the future, at least in BA or in, B, in Buenos Aires, because uh, I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know when we're going to play again. So I think that right now it's, oh my God, it's so dark. I just see my screen there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I think that, and I wrote it on Twitter, the biggest hope we have right now in Derby is like, it's a bunch of volunteering. Like, this is the moment for people, not only volunteering your community, some people don't die, which is also really cool, but inside of Derby, like, start to volunteer, like, start working on that stuff with your league that you never w were able to work on because you were prioritizing competitive play. It's like this is the time to train officials. This is the time to learn the rules, to read the casebook, to do boot camps, to do to watch games. Like it's now because we're gonna be like this. I don't think there's gonna be any kind of derby until November, mm. at least in Buenos Aires, at least. So, what I'm just hoping for the future in ter in derby terms, at least for BA, is like people starting to work in all those uh projects they had like 
relegated because of competitive play, you know, of uh, mostly officiating because like this is a wonderful time to train officials. Wonderful time to do classes via Zoom, meet, WhatsApp, whatever, and to read and to all do all, all that stuff that you didn't get to do. So I hope we get out of the situation with more officials, with certified officials, with recognized officials. Um, and yeah, I'm just like really super hopeful that's going to happen because I absolutely have no hope whatsoever for competitive play. It also gives more help. Well, oh, I tried to make homework for, for us. We uh, and a teammate. He make, you know, practice uh, homework uh, based on games and I make kind of like more theoretically, but we didn't succeed at all. You know? Like we're like 20 people and only five made them. So <laughs> it was like, okay, we're not doing that either. <laughs> it's, still, it's still five people doing them. I mean, the other way of thinking about it is you got five people to do that. Uh, yeah. Which is better than no one. Um, but I was going to say also, uh, it also gives time. The other thing that was in that WFTDA in the union was the changes in WFTDA. So it also perhaps gives WTDA time to change things to make it perhaps easier for teams in Argentina to pay dues to apply and to, to, yeah. apply and to get those officials um, certifications. So perhaps the other positive side is that when we start doing things again, we will have a, an improved way of it's being in national sport. I think it's going to bloom so much after all of this. If, if teams use this that time this that competitive time to work on stuff that they will never be able to work it's just going to bloom like the first time everyone gets back to the track it's going to be super fun and there's going to be a lot of people wanting to put on the track what they learned and again i mean remember you don't have to be part of a wftda mm. member league to be a wftda official yes so that that opportunity is always open to anyone you don't need to be part of a member league to be a certified official so that this is the moment like it's now game requirements are suspended a lot of things have been flexibilized so if there's a moment to get like your credentials and your fancy things going on yeah. we should make sure you should yeah. make the best use of the time we have right yes uh, Okay, so on that positive note, um, we are now up to two hours of this podcast. Uh, so I feel I should let, at least for the sake of our listeners, um, and for you guys, almost certainly have other things to do with your lives. So I will let everyone, I think, if we all uh, let everyone go at this point. But thank you very much for all attending. Um, I hope you feel that it's been a useful podcast to represent Argentina. And I hope our listeners have learned a bit about if nothing else, how big and varied Argentina is as a country and in terms of World Derby as well. So thank you all for coming and I'll let you thanks all... To you. And thanks to everyone, Manu, Gar, Gare and everyone. Yes, but thanks especially to Car for actually corralling yes. everyone else to turn up because we couldn't have done it without her for this um, for this podcast. Yes. Okay, thanks thank to you. all of you and thanks Sam to try to always mention Argentina, whatever we because we are here and we are trying to roller derby and we are trying to train and to well to grow as a sport and as a community here and that helps us really. Thank you. It's our pleasure. So thank you everyone and we wave goodbye and at this podcast now. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Bye. Stay home. Thank you. Ciao.